Good morning. morning. Pastor Dave's got the day off. He's asked me to to continue the journey through the book of uh, uh, 1 Corinthians. So if you take your Bibles and open it to Romans. Romans chapter 12, that's your auxiliary text we're going to be reading today because it's a lot similar to 1 Corinthians. In fact, um, what I'd like to do is read the 1 Corinthians uh, 12 verses 3 through uh, 13 passage and then make some comments about... uh, how it uh, relates to our First Corinthians passage. Bob has sermon outlines. Apparently we ran out. If you need a sermon outline, raise your hand and uh, Bob and Jeremiah will get that to you. Re- keep it up high so they can see you. Looks like you don't have to come any further than about five rows there. Bob, another one over here. Over on this side. Oh, Shannon's got a late, late hand. Anybody else? Could you use a couple in the balcony too, uh, Jeremiah, if you could run up there. Anybody else? Raise your hand up high if you need a sermon outline. This actually is a good illustration of the body of Christ. Jeremiah and Bob are fulfilling a crucial need that people can get their sermon outlines in order to uh, be able to track along because I'm not easy to track along with. I don't even track with myself. Um, One of the reasons why I use a sermon outline is to make sure I stay on track. Um, I I don't know how many of you know about my teaching style, but I can chase rabbits. And the bigger the rabbit, the more I want to chase it. And this helps me to stay, uh, stay focused. Romans chapter 12, that's, hopefully that's where your Bibles are open to right now. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Rome and trying to give them instructions about what it means to be a church. And so uh, this passage goes really, really well with the 1 Corinthians 12 a passage. And so Jesse Howard is going to come and read uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 13. Please stand out of respect for reading God's word. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not give all the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. This is God's word. You may be seated. And as you're being seated, if you take out the sermon online that uh, Bob and Jeremiah made sure that you had access to, um, the first uh, blank that you can fill in is the word solidarity. Because I really believe that's what we're looking at in the body of Christ. We're looking to achieve solidarity. Um, solidarity, if you're, you're wondering what that word means, it basically means uh, a unity based upon a community of interests, objectives, or standards. And hopefully our interests or our standard is Jesus. If it's not, we're going to find this in the body of Christ or in the, when we get together with each other. One of the really, really cool things that takes place every year is the Good Friday service at Christ Chapel on the campus of Hillsdale College. And it's really cool for me because um, it's about uh, 10 to 15, maybe 20 different churches all getting together and worshiping together. That's the way it should be. Now, we, we're an independent church here and we have our own convictions and our own way of thinking and that's okay. In fact, hopefully as we go through this whole section on the body of Christ, you'll see that it's necessary. But we do need to have a common goal and a common focus, and hopefully that's Jesus. Um, that, that, that trusting in Christ and realizing the salvation that comes in Christ will unify us in order to, to stay on the, on the same team. Um, what's really, really cool about, about 
playing in the, in the band here and playing praise music. I've been involved in music since 1967. Well, actually, I started playing tuba in 1965. That doesn't count because it's tuba. <laughs> Sorry. I should, probably shouldn't. Hopefully there's no tuba players here. But I've been playing in bands all my life since 1968. My brother and I played in a band in 1968. 1968, and here we are still playing in a band. I had a music business for 12 years, and I got really good when the bands came in to buy their stuff from my music store of picking out the drummer, the lead guitarist, and the lead vocalist, and the rhythm guitarist really quickly. Bass players are weird. (laughs) They're the ones with the little hat and the striped pants and the platform shoes. Lead singers are all over the place. Wow! (laughs) Lead guitarists are just plain cool. And it didn't take long to learn their personalities and learn how different they are in their personalities. And you know what? They play together and make music together because they have a common purpose and a common goal. I'm sure if you talk to the orchestra members at the college and the play in the orchestra, they could tell you how clarinet players differ from trombone players. (laughs) We won't go into there. And how drummers, never mind. We definitely won't go there. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. And one of the things that irritated the snot out of me, can I say that? Okay, good. My wife gave me approval, so you all just be quiet. (laughs) One thing that irritated the snot out of me during the COVID experience that we had to worship separately is that people were promoting the idea that we were being the church during that time. We were not. The church, by definition, means a body of believers gathered. If we're spread out all over kingdom come, we're believers, and we're being edified and being encouraged, but at that point in history, we couldn't be the church by definition. We desperately need each other, and boy, has the science proven that. Over and over again, we're, we're still feeling the effects. My... my uh, Son-in-law is a teacher in school. They're still feeling the effects of having a, a distance education and distance learning and all that kind of crazy things. Folks, we need each other. We were created in each other. And that's why our service orientation, if you will look on your sermon outline, inside left-hand panel, it says this. Christian solidarity points to Christian maturity, a love for Jesus, and a humble spirit because we were created to need each other. Division comes from a sick spirit which handicaps the church. The church meaning the gathered ones, gathered believers. So the passage that we're going to be looking at in just a short while is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you want to turn there, you can go ahead and do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, Pastor Dave left off on verse uh, 20, and so we're going to pick up on verse 21 and read through verse 26. This whole section, actually you can make a real strong case Chapters 12, 13, and 14 are all about the body of Christ. And what's smack dab in the middle of 12, 13, and 14? 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter. The Apostle Paul knows love has to be the predominant uh, force, the predominant attitude among the body of Christ over and over get, get along. Do you realize that there are 40 thousand different denominations, 40,000, and yet if we all look to Jesus, we can be united. You know why? Because I have about 40,000 different parts to me, and yet I get along, I, I get along. <laughs> as long as my body's healthy, it works great. But when I had a stroke back in 19, uh, 19, 2014, all of a sudden, what was going on here never got here. I could think what I wanted to say. I, it, it, it was right there, 
My wife would say, what? When the body of Christ is functioning properly, we can do amazing things. But when we're sick or had a stroke or a heart attack, we need extra special attention. And the Apostle Paul wants us to understand we're like a body, a physical body, and we desperately need each other. I needed platelets in my body which will dissolve blood clots to do its job because I had a clot that was severely affecting my uh, ability to think. Well, not to think, but to do. And folks, the body is an amazing thing. Think about this for a minute. What has to be in your bloodstream alone in order for you to clot when you need to and dissolve a clot when you need to? How does that take place? And if one takes over, you're dead. Same is true in the body of Christ. If we do our job, even as obscure and as covered over as a agent in our bloodstream to prevent clotting or to produce clotting, depending on our situation, even as something as covered up as that, every part of the body of Christ is absolutely crucial. Please listen very, very carefully as I am uh, going to read for uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 21 through 26. Please stand again out of respect for reading God's word. 1 Corinthians 12, at verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think less honorable we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. This is God's word. You may be seated. If you want to take your sermon out lines and follow along, we're ready for point number one. What does Apostle Paul want us to know about the unity of the body of Christ? Number one, Christian unity is not uniformity. Pastor Dave made this one of his points two weeks ago when he was uh, doing the first part of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it's important for us to realize we're not all the same. Boy, do we have the opposite of that thinking in our culture today. We're trying to make even men and women the same. Oy vey. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Last week, uh, two weeks ago, when Pastor Dave was in his sermon from verses 4 to 6, also in 1 Corinthians 12, this is what Paul says there. There are different kinds of gift, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. And from today, when we read Romans chapter 12, it says this, just as each of us has one body with many members, and those members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to it. 40,000 denominations, and the Spirit of God has ordained that we need every single one. Each one brings a special focus to the body of Christ, if we would just wake up and realize what it is. You need Baptists. I know you're Methodist, or you're attending a free Methodist church. You need the Baptists. My wife's a Baptist, so there. She's become free Methodist. I used to be a Knight of Brethren. The first eight years of our lives, poo, poo, poo. I was trying to make her United Brethren. She was trying to make us Baptists. You know what? We both succeeded. I became Baptist and she became United Brethren. We changed views on predestination, on election, on eternal security, all those kind of things. Wasn't that weird, baby? <laughs> you know what? I needed her and she needed me because you know what? 
We're both right. You say, Pastor Keith, Baptists and the Methodists, Arminians and Calvinists can't both be right. Why? I'll have a talk with you sometime. I think the biggest difference that they have is the way they look at Scripture. Arminians tend to look at it from man's point of view. Calvinists tend to look at it from God's point of view. Which one's right? Both! Stick that in your free Methodist pipe and smoke it. I've been formally trained in the Arminian camp and I've been formally trained in the Calvinist camp. And I'll tell you what, they both make great points from the Word of God. And if we would wake up and listen to them, we would better understand the tension of the body of Christ and be able to be a better body of Christ that would have a bigger impact in the world rather than going... (laughs) It's terrible what we do to the body of Christ. United we stand, divided we fall. Jesus himself said a kingdom divided against itself can not stand. When uh, our nation realized that we had to separate from England in order for us to be able to enjoy the human rights that we felt that we were fighting for and wanted to live for, when they made the Declaration of Independence, Ben Franklin came out of that meeting and said, We should either hang together or we will certainly hang separately. And folks, I really believe that the body of Christ needs to take that advice as we go into the next two decades because the world, especially Western civilization, is becoming increasingly hostile towards the gospel. And if we don't hang together and we don't look to each other and quit our arguing with each other, we certainly will hang separately. I'm encouraging you to hang together because we desperately need each other, even though we're increasingly different. 40,000 denominations, but I really believe that God has ordained them all in order for us to realize we need to look at the scriptures in a way bigger than ourselves because God's a little bit bigger than you. Tongue in cheek. He's a lot bigger than you. Number two, What does Paul want us to do? If you're filling out the blanks, listen, those blanks are there for you. I know I need blanks because otherwise I'll go. And you know what? That kills a preacher. And if I see you do it, I will come after you. (laughs) Because I refuse to allow the body of Christ to suffer just because you're tired. Number two, flashy, prominent, and gifted does not mean more significant, important, or special. Look at verses 22 and 23. On the contrary, there are parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. I've been involved in children's ministry for a big portion of my life. In fact, my wife and I uh, were involved in children's ministry before I became a senior pastor for 12 years Yeah, it was about 12 years, 74 to 86. Um, We had 135 kids in junior church. So, ah! Here's the the thing. Whenever I do VBSs or kids college or those type of big uh, events, I always kiss the feet. Well, not literally because that's gross. But figuratively kiss the feet of two people. The head of snacks and the head of games. Why? Kids aren't there to hear me teach. Some five-year-old that comes to VBS is not there to go, oh, Pastor Keith, please teach me the Word of God. I want to... They're here for the snacks and the games. And I get my 10 minutes of window of opportunity to preach the gospel to them because the games and the, the snack people do their job. Even though nobody gives them credit, by gosh, I'm going to give them credit. Thank you, snacks and games people. (laughs) Yes, Josiah knows. He's been involved in these things. 
listen, and even though they're behind the scenes and nobody pays attention to them, nobody really gives them regard, I as a leader know how crucially important they are. And they're doing their job and not wanting all the glamour and the big... Do you know what the body, the physical body, it has an ailment when one part wants to take over uh, an area bigger than it was designed to, to be? We call it cancer. When one part does more than what it's intended to be, when it takes over a particular area where it's not supposed to be taken over, and it becomes, it grows into something bigger than what God intended to be. Folks, the body of Christ has a lot of cancer it needs to be treating. Because we fail to understand that even if nobody notices that we're doing our job, it's still crucially important. Do you know what happened in March of 1981? Anybody, I got $2 for anybody can tell. Now, first service people, if you're here again, you're disqualified. <laughs> March of 1981. Time's up. <laughs> Save my $2. President Reagan was shot. Actually had somebody in the first service tell me that they had a good friend of theirs that attended to President Reagan when he was in ER after he'd been shot. Uh, talk Clifford Kelly. He has a friend that actually attended uh, to, the, to President Reagan. Yeah, attended to President Reagan. What was really cool is that um, he was in the hospital for two weeks and basically the government was running without his leadership because he was in the hospital recovering from a gunshot, okay? We got along fine. The nation did fine. What was really, really interesting, though, is that at the same time in the city of Philadelphia, the garbage collectors were on strike. They went one week, and the city was in turmoil. Why? Because we can do without the President of the United States necessarily doing his job. Everything else will take care of itself. But garbage collectors, if they don't do their job, that stinks. And nobody thought about them at all until they weren't doing their job. <laughs> kind of like media and sound people. <laughs> How many of you think about media and sound people during a worship service? You don't at all if they're, if they're flawless in their execution of their duties. But they make one mistake. Hey, change the slide. No, no, don't do it. <laughs> You're all over it, Grace. Well, I shouldn't do that because they're behind the scenes. But Grace and you're doing a great job. It is Grayson, isn't it? Okay. Good. Three. What does Paul want us to know about the unity of the body of Christ? The socially awkward and those whose gift is obscured are God's special people. Look what it says in verse 23. The parts that we think less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable uh, are treated with special modesty. In, in the passage from uh, Romans chapter 12, it says this. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Folks, in this church are all sorts of people who behind the scenes make worship wonderful so that you can come in here and worship God without all sorts of distractions. My wife and I, when we go on vacation, we visit churches. In fact, sometimes we'll visit two or three um, in the course of, of uh, one or two days because that's just kind of what we do. And some churches we pull up and go, oh, I don't know. You know why? Because it looks like it's been run through a stubble beater. I, you don't know what a stubble beater is. It's a big lawnmower that runs over big, uh, big cornfields and stuff and just lays them flat. Nobody's paid attention. The bushes, the, the sidewalk is cracked and, and hasn't had attention in 40 years and the, the mortar's coming out of the bricks and the, there's plastic over the windows and you go, yikes. And then you go in and it gets scarier because you feel like you got a label on your forehead that says fresh meat, fresh meat, <laughs> fresh meat. And they're going, ha, ah, ah. ha. <laughs> Why? They haven't seen a visitor in years. What are we doing there? 
And then they do something even more horrible. During the middle of the service, we have visitors. <laughs> right here. Won't you stand up and introduce yourself? <laughs> no. The body of Christ needs trustees to take care of those things. The body of Christ needs greeters who are kind and, and friendly, but not weird. <laughs> the body of Christ needs competent musicians. Because as a musician, nothing puts me on edge as out-of-tune guitars. Oh, boy. Can this be over quickly? Worship? That's the last thing on my mind. I'm just trying to make it alive at the end of the service. We need the body of Christ. We need people like Grayson and, and is that Scott up and doing their job, and you never even know they're there if they're doing a great job. In fact, that's when they've done their best job. You never even notice. The socially awkward and those whose gift is obscured are God's special people. And folks, if you're a mother or a father, or if you uh, watch over people, you know that when someone uh, is struggling with uh, maybe autism or they're struggling with some type of mental uh, illness or they're struggling with some type of physical disability, you give them extra special attention because they need it. And rightfully so. If you don't get special attention at church, it means that the other body members think you're okay, you're healthy. We need to give special attention to those people that have special needs. That's part of what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. I have this little phrase that I, I thought about where love is the greatest value, giving more attention to the weak is a greater good than sucking up to the powerful. And folks, that's exactly what the body of Christ should be doing. Number four, the body that is, uh, that is, is God's doing for his glory. Verse 24 and 25, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lack it. God has put together the body of Christ the way that he wanted to be, uh, be put together. He's put in this church the people in order for this church to be able to do its job. In fact, one of the things I learned early on in children's ministry, if I had an idea for a ministry and I promoted that idea for ministry but could not find the people qualified and capable and willing to do it, we dropped it. Why? Because God didn't provide the people to do it. One thing that this church does really, really well is youth ministry and children's ministry. I don't know how many of you uh, know this or not, but on Wednesday nights, there's about 90 kids or so, uh, there's at least 90 people, close to 100 people here, most of them kids that we minister to. And a lot of them are street kids that need special attention. It'll break your heart to work with these, some of these kids. One kid I was like 9.15 and everybody had gone home by 8.15 and he's just hanging around and says, hey, won't your parents be concerned about you? Pfft, no. My dad left the house years ago. My mom's always drunk at this time of the evening and laying on the couch. Nobody misses me. You don't think kids like that need special attention? They do. And I'm grateful that this church gives its resources to Pastor Kurt and Pastor Jody to be able to do children's ministry. I'm grateful for the dozens of volunteers that come out of this church to support those ministries because Pastor Kurt and Pastor Jody couldn't even begin to do the things that they're doing without dozens of volunteers. But this church supports them and brings them out of the woodwork year-round, year-round. The body it is, is God's doing for his glory. He's put the people here that we need. And it's up to the leadership to be able to use them properly so that they can do what uh, the body of Christ needs to be doing. Um, there's, there's a story that I heard probably 30, 40 years ago about, uh, kind of illustrate this a little bit. Um, 
Have you ever been to El Cerritos and watched those waiters? Six plates full of food. And I'm going, oh! They're, they're amazing. I, I'm not sure I could even lift six plates with food extended like them. I mean, figure the torque. It's, don't figure the torque. <laughs> Some of you are like Sheldon Cooper and going. You're... <laughs> but this illustration said this. What if one of those guys came out and a little kid ran into him and all six plates ended up on the floor? What would a mercy people person do? Yeah, get, be right there and help him out and you know, just, just, help him out. What would a generous person do? Help pay for the loss. Help pay for anything that they may have to, to cover on their own. What would a prophet do? Hey, kid, be smart. I mean, you're just carrying six plates and you've got little kids around here. You need to understand that you need to be aware of things around you. That's what a prophet person would do. What would an encourager do? Yeah, hey, it's not the end of the world. Maybe the end of your job, but it's not the end of the world. <laughs> we can get through this. Which one's the best? Ah, now, some of you are leaning towards generous or compassion or mercy or, or uh, profit. You're leaning one way or another. That's probably an indication of the, of the gifting that the Spirit has given you. But the reality is the body of Christ needs all of them. So don't be critical of somebody else that doesn't see a situation the way you do. You have a special way of looking at it because of the gifting you have. But just, and listen, the two people that find it the hardest to get together are mercy people and compassion people and prophets. <laughs> if you don't believe that, just read the end of Acts chapter 15 when Barnabas, an encourager, gets together with Paul, a prophet. Bam! Barnabas wants to encourage his uh, probably relative, John Mark. Paul goes, I'm done with him. He bailed out the first time. I'm not. Which one's right? I believe both of them were. Because God knew the job was bigger than just one team. And as a result of that conflict, you know, that's how uh, Baptist uh, multiplication takes place. Have a Baptist church, they have a fight, now there's two Baptist churches. <laughs> and they have fights, now there's four Baptist churches. You're sitting in a Protestant church for much of the same reason. <laughs> think about that. Think about that. <laughs> Five. We should have a musketeer mentality when it comes to the church. All for one and one for all. Oh. There should be no division in the body, verses 25 and 26, but his parts should take equal concern for each other. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. And each member belongs to all the others. I don't know about you, but when I have a toothache, I can't do anything else. When my wife and I were in Florida, boy, this has been a long time ago, I had a cavity right in between these front two teeth. Teeth? Tooths? Right here. And it drove me nuts. I couldn't enjoy our vacation. I couldn't think. I couldn't, it just felt like somebody had put daggers on both sides of my forehead. It just hurt. Listen, it's hard for, the, for your body to operate efficiently if you got all sorts of pain. One of the reasons why I believe the Apostle Paul encourages pastors to have good, solid families is because if a pastor has to worry about a family member that's gone astray or a family member that's in trouble or a family member that's wrestling with the faith, he can't give proper attention to the church. He's got to give proper attention to his own family member. And I really believe that's one of the reasons why the Apostle Paul says that a pastor should have a good, solid foundation at home first before they ever try to do ministry. 
Otherwise, they're going to be too distracted to do a good job. And folks, that's what the body of Christ should be like. If we see a member of our body that needs something, we should be all in to, to, to help them out, especially if we have the ability. One of the really painful things that's, that's taken place in my wife and my lives is that um, here in the last three or four years, from here down doesn't work the same. I go upstairs like this anymore. You know why? They don't work. So I've learned that I've got to put my time and my gifts and my abilities, my, my efforts in other things rather than helping out. But I love to help out. When I hear about uh, somebody had a tree limb go down, there, there, there's a bunch of guys going to saw it up and to take care of it and to help out somebody like that. Man, I want to be there, but I know I'm just going to get in the way with my physical condition the way I am. But there's a lot of you guys that do that and praise God you're there and you're doing that. I'll come back to that a little bit later on. I want to uh, go on now with number uh, worship point. Worshiping the God of the universe is always more impressive, effective, encouraging, and fun in the midst of a healthy body committed to giving God the glory. I don't know about you, but when I've been in a worship service and when everybody's on board, it is just thrilling to, to be there and to sing and get caught up in it. It's kind of like at a sporting event when your team comes back from 15 points down and, and wins with the last minute and go, la, 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 hey, 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 goodbye. <laughs> okay, that's not always that Christian, but <laughs> it's just fun to be caught up. In, folks, worship should be fun. When we're all on one page, when we're all singing with all of our might, when we're all uh, there to worship the God of the universe, folks, you can get caught up in that. And it happens from time to time in this church. It should happen more often. But you know when it doesn't happen? When somebody is in the congregation and going, oh boy, when's this guy going to be done? He's talking about the body of Christ the entire 30 minutes. What's with this guy? Porter, shut up! That kills the body of Christ. And that's why when you start sleeping, I'm coming after you. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Those of you who have been here a long time know I do ill. <laughs> why? I feed off of you. If you don't believe that's true, you've never b done public speaking. When I see your eyes glued in with mine, when I see you paying attention, I, when I see you writing in your sermon notes, whoa, yes, go! But when I see you doing this, I'm dead. We just call it quits, let's quit. Now, wait a minute. You're saying... Pastor Keith, you're saying that we can make you stop if we just look at our watches? <laughs> Gospel application. It's only by coming to a... It's only kind of coming to a heightened awareness of God's great love for you as demonstrated by Jesus on the cross that Christians can begin to be more mature, loving, and humble so that they promote a healthy body by being more concerned with others than themselves. When you look to Jesus, you'll see the epitome of being concerned about others rather than being about, uh, concerned about yourself. And that will uh, energize you and focus you and help you to be more concerned about others because one of the things that kills the body of Christ is pride, ego. I, I've shared this before with, with uh, I think probably with this congregation, but when I was in seminary, there was a guy by the name of Steve Brown who was my homiletics uh, professor. He's in charge of uh, Key Life Ministries on, on the, a lot of radio stations. But anyway, um, he tells about one guy that he knew in his church who would go into big companies like uh, Westinghouse and, and Whirlpool and GM and Ford and those big companies with tens of thousands of employees and that he would be hired to find the problem in order to make it run more efficiently. You know what he said to, he looked for? If you're looking for the problem in a corporation, find the ego. And then you'll find the problem. Same is true with churches. 
If you have pride that wants to make yourself greater, you're a cancer to the body of Christ. You need to kill it. For by the grace given to me, this is from Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of them, and if you, one of you, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought. And then from Philippians chapter 2, this is one of my favorite passages. The Apostle Paul says this of Jesus. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should not only look to your own interests, but the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking upon him his nature, the, the nature of a servant, and being ha- made in human likeness. Pride will kill a church. In fact, if you sense that your church is coming apart, you may be the problem. And folks, I don't know about you all, but I can walk into a church and within 10 minutes know whether or not that church has a pride problem and is being fractured or not because you can just sense it. I'm grateful that this church has very few of those kind of problems. For the most part, we run really, really smoothly here. This is a good church. And there are a lot of good churches in Hillsdale County. You should be blessed to know that folks, there's 40 churches that I would recommend to you that you could come today, but I'm glad you're here. (laughs) Because they're good churches. That's not true of every county. It's not true to a lot of places in the world. Spiritual challenge. If the church, the body of Christ, is ever going to be uh, acquire a musketeer's perspective, it must acquire a better central nervous and circulatory system than that it currently possesses. Only by being effectively connected to our head, even Jesus, and allowing our reflexes to be controlled by his spirit, can we begin to really be the church and discern who is a part of the body of Christ and who is not. I believe that Jesus is the head and that the spirit of God works through our spiritual uh, nervous system in order to control all the parts of the body. And if we're listening to the head and obeying the head, we can work together as a body and get a lot done. But if we've had a stroke and that communication gets cut off, then all sorts of bad things happen. Or worse, if our circulatory system, which I believe is love, I believe love is like the blood flow through a a physical body. If love is flowing through the body of Christ, then it's alive and vital and doing its job. But if the blood flow gets cut off to the heart, that church dies. And love is thinking more of the welfare and being of others than looking at yourself, at least agape love is that. I want to share with you a passage of Scripture at the end of Ephesians chapter 4. You need to understand the context of Ephesians chapter 4 because it talks about the gifts of the Spirit just like Romans 12 and just like 1 Corinthians chapter 20, uh, 12 that we've been talking about the whole time. But, at, but what the Apostle Paul says at the end of chapter 4 is crucially important for us. Okay, remember, this whole thing is in the context. He's just talked about the body of Christ. Then he says this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And listen to this, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness Get rid of all rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ in God has forgiven you. Do you hear what he says? If you turn on the members of the body of Christ, it's like the autoimmune system. It's like a body turning on itself. And folks, that's a serious disease. Now, having said all that, there are times when there comes to be an infection in the body of Christ and it neither needs to be treated or cut out. 
And the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John and the Apostle James talk about how to do that. Jesus talks about how to do that. But it should never be entered into lightly. It should be just like you going in for surgery. You don't just go, hey, go ahead and cut this out of my eye. No, it's something you look at and you try to alternate roots in order to make sure that you don't have to do surgery. But surgery is kind of the last result. The same is true of the body of Christ. In fact, Jesus himself, in the parable about the, sea, uh, the weeds and the, and the wheat, uh, wheat, the seeds that were sown in the field, and an evil man came in and sowed weeds among the wheat, and the disciples say, yeah, we go in and take out the weeds. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Wait until I do it at the end of time. Otherwise, you may hurt the wheat that's there. You may hurt the body of Christ that's there. But the Apostle Paul tells us there's times that it's necessary to cut some person out of the body of Christ because they're an infection. They're hurting the body. And I said something in the first service, and I, I want to make it better in this service. I said in the first service, that's a job for the prophet because he should know what God has to say about that situation. But it's also profit, a, a job for compassion people and encouragers and mercy people. Why? Because you need the whole wisdom of the counsel of God in addressing that particular problem. Apostle Paul basically says as much in Galatians chapter 6. Okay, last one. So what? Paul is calling for unity in the midst of great diversity. The healthiest unity and most evangelistically effective and impressive examples of unity always exist in the midst of loving, harmonious diversity. Harmonious diversity. A healthy interconnection of diverse body parts. I, I, I have a quote inside your sermon outline. You can follow along. It's by Dr. Paul Brand and Philip Yancey. Paul, a master of simile and metaphor, did not say the people of God are like the body of Christ. In every place, Paul said, we are the body of Christ. I don't know about you, but that's sobering. This is not Keith Porter. My spirit and my heart is Keith Porter. This is only the covering that the apartment that I'm living in while Keith Porter is inside operating. But people make judgments about me inside based upon what me outside does. What's the world thinking of Jesus? Because we are the body of Christ. We are making impressions on the world, positively or negatively. And I'll never forget the day I had a, a discussion with my daughter's basketball coach because he was wanting practice at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. I said, Coach, my daughter can't be there. Sunday is God's day. She'll be in church. She can't come if you're going to have practice on Sunday morning. And I said, why would you do that? You know what his response was? Why do you care? I look at churches, and they're all arguing with each other. They can't get along. You're not on the same team. Why would you even care that I'm taking a Sunday out? You can't even get together with yourself, let alone be civil to me. He shut me right up because he was right. The churches in that area, We need to be the body of Christ and make an impression on people for good and not, you, 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 you. well, those Baptists, you, 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 you. Those, those Catholics, you, 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 you. those Episcopalians, you, 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 you. those apostolic people. You need them. They each bring something to the table that free Methodists don't have. And the quicker we learn that, the better we're going to be. Let's pray. Father, help us. Help us to understand that there are thousands of people in Hillsdale County, in other churches, that we should love and respect and encourage. 
Help us not to be prideful and arrogant, thinking that we alone have the truth. (laughs) Nothing could be further from the truth. Help us to do what the Apostle Paul says in our memory verse today. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Help us to do that through the Prince of Peace, even Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.